Very good. You're ready. Thank you very much. So, hello, friends. My name is Aslam Sheikh, your host for this evening, and I'm an ambassador of Swiss Education Foundation, a dedicated platform to build strong educational relationship between Switzerland and India. I'm just wondering how many people would actually know this fact that India first ever signed the Treaty of Friendship with a country called Switzerland in 1948. And hence, we are celebrating now 71 plus years of long and strong friendship with Switzerland. This is our 11th webinar in the series and has been broadcasted live on Facebook and YouTube channel. The aim of this webinar series is to bring together the top-notch foreign universities, experts, and thought leaders from India to discuss the opportunities in the selected field of education. So let's move on. And today's topic is education in post-COVID-19 world, where Switzerland is leading the world as the safest country by Forbes recent report. To discuss this exciting subject, we have with us the eminent panel of speakers, and let me do the honor of introducing them. To pay respect to our lady speakers in the panel, let me start with her, Ms. Devika Chatterjee. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us. Let me introduce Ms. Devika. With over 20 years of experience in the field of education and having taught in various reputed Cambridge, IB, ISC, and ICSC school in India and abroad, Ms. Devika Chatterjee has emerged, uh, has managed various portfolios during her journey as an educationist and currently holds the Burilby branch of JBCN International School as Director Principal. Ms. Chatterjee has also been instrumental in setting up the One World International IB School in Singapore. She has been instrumental in implementing and channelizing the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals as the long-term vision of the school. She is also the recipient of various awards, which include Ethical Educational Leadership Award by International Education Awards, and Best Principal Performance Award by Global Achievers Foundation, to name a few. Thank you very much, Madam, for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Another speaker, respected Mr. Otmar Hardiger. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us today. You're welcome, Consul my pleasure. Thank you. Consul General of Switzerland, Ajib, office in Mumbai in August 2018. He joined the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs in 1986 and served in various positions in Rome, Tehran, New York, Dresden, Bonn, Jeddah, Prague, and Frankfurt. Almost covered the two ends of the world. So from 2009 to 2014, he served as Deputy Head of Finance at the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs in Bern. From 2014 to 2018, and prior his transfer to Mumbai, he was Council General in Hu Chi Minh, city of Vietnam. Mr. Hardiger holds a diploma in business administration and advanced studies of international relations. We welcome you, sir. Let me take an opportunity to introduce R. Max Behisht from Switzerland. Welcome, my friend. Uh, can I call you Max for my easy reference? Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Max. So Max is the academic dean of Cesaritz College and Culinary Arts Academy Switzerland from Luzon. In addition to his current role, Mr. Max is also hospitality, employee engagement, customer experience, and leadership professional, and the founder of RMB Group, a boutique training and consulting firm. He is also a multi multilingual keynote speaker, lecturer, and storyteller. He held multiple international finance service and commercial roles with the science company DuPont. Relocating 25 times in the last 20 years, he has been undergone business administration studies at Gothenburg University, Sweden, European Business School, Germany, and the Graduate School of Business Administration in Kobe University, Japan. Welcome, Max. Thank you very much. And uh, my sir and uh, eminent speaker, Dr. Vishal Talwar. Dr. Talwar, welcome to the session. Dr. Talwar is the Dean of School Management as well as the Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at BML Munjal University. He has been Assistant Dean with Espigen School of Global Management, where I had an opportunity to study myself. Dr. Talwar had spent close to 12 years in the United Kingdom and served at prestigious London School of Economics and the Hanley Business School, University of Reading. He has also presented his research at prestigious conferences such as the American Marketing Association Conference. 
His co-authored paper dealing with the economic worth of product development, product placement, was nominated for the Market Research Society UK Silver Medal in 2017. Dr. Talwar is a PhD from Manchester Business School, where he was awarded a doctoral scholarship by the Shell Oil Company. I welcome Dr. Talwar. You are on mute, so can you please unmute yourself? Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just let me try if I can. Now try, please. Thank Wait. you. Thank you very much, Asla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So, uh, Let's move on to today's topic, and it's education in post-COVID-19 world where Switzerland leads the world's safest, being the world's safest nation in the world by Forbes magazine. And in order to invite to the speaker and begin this session, I just wanted to say that we are going to see the different world altogether, not only from the business point of view, but also from the education point of view. And we all are related and somewhere connected with the education. With my audience who are joining us, we have got the audience coming from the education background, consulting backgrounds, uh, counselors of high schools, uh, students and parents also joining us here on Zoom as well as on live on Facebook and YouTube. So we have to, a total uh, as on date 43 participants joining on Zoom and rest joining us live onto the social media channel. So to begin with, I would like to first move to uh, Mr. Hardiger and would like to congratulate you and to your government for doing such a tremendous uh, job and showing us a hope as a world to see that we can get over with this uh, disease. So can you please take us that what measures uh, government has taken you think has really helped Switzerland to uh, become the safest nation in the world by post vaccine? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction and also for the congratulations. The credits I have to give to the government and people that really have done the job in Switzerland. But uh, I'm very happy to share with the audience, with you also some uh, particulars maybe about the Swiss system, about the, the reasons behind why in the Forbes uh, report, Switzerland did uh, that well. And Frankly speaking, I was myself even surprised to, to, to see that we are on the top of that list, uh, thinking that we have countries that have had much less uh, corona cases than in Switzerland. In Switzerland, Switzerland we had around 30,000 uh, corona inf infections in Switzerland and about 1,600 uh, victims of the corona uh, virus. So it's not that we have completely, yeah, we, we, we had such an easy time the last couple of months. And uh, I've been also told that uh, in previous reports, actually Switzerland was not on the top yet. Uh, that's why perhaps it's good to quickly have a look a little bit uh, what influenced this result, uh, on what basis this, this uh, Forbes report uh, has been done. In fact, it's the result of a very in-depth analysis by Deep Knowledge Group, and they have done, a, yeah, they have, in a very elaborate analysis, they looked at uh, various categories and various quantitative and qualitative parameters, and I was told, or I read that over one eleven thousand data points have been collected to 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 come up to this result and just as the categories uh, to mention there has been like quarantine efficiency, healthcare readiness, monitoring and detection, emergency preparedness, government efficiency of risk management. So you see, these are all factors that are not strictly related to the, to the uh, infection numbers or, or, or casualty numbers. So it's more like really what the health system is all about what the government system is all about and the data that they have co or the, the collected data they were all from public sources also important to know is from the world health organization from john hopkins universities and others so what came out of course is what we could expect that switzerland has a very robust and uh, as an excellent health care system so it, in terms of quality but also in uh, in terms of quantity for the size of the country, good infrastructure, 
then of course government structure, government system has certainly helped also in this case. We, I would say, we are not always famous for taking quick and swift decisions in Switzerland, but in this case, in the extraordinary crisis situation, I would say we, we have handled pretty well. And uh, again, also, we have, a, as you might know, we have a, a federal system and a very decentralized uh, government structure also. That helped, again, also later on in the implementation of the measures, also to look carefully in each of the cantons what needed to be done and, and, and really there the, the local uh, governments also they, they have acted very I would say very intelligently and in, in, in very appropriately also over this time. Right. So what the report found actually also that, that Switzerland did particularly well in the careful way to relax lockdown without sacrificing public health and safety. So that also gives us an indication what uh, the, 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 the report also looked at and also it had attested, of course, a strong resilience of the economy, which of course also helped in this case that the economy was, was in a good state when, when the crisis happened. Right. Thank you when very we much. Look at, maybe just briefly, when we look at the, at the measures taken at at the, at the start of the crisis, it's very much what other countries did as well in, in, in Europe. And also even what uh, India has done now in the, in the camp last couple of months. So it's nothing really what we would have done or we would have invented more than this. Perhaps import, interesting to, to mention in, in comparison now with the Indian context is that uh, we, have been, of course, in a very delicate situation somehow also from the geographical situation, very much interconnected with the neighboring countries, a lot of uh, uh, transits also uh, from people transit in Switzerland also for the size of the country. Also, one problem that we had to face was for a lockdown, we had to very carefully look at these uh, people coming from other uh, neighboring countries to Switzerland, for instance, we have over 300,000 people that every day cross the, the borders just to work in Switzerland also. So we could not take just a very, uh, we could completely block the borders, even though we, we had to uh, restrict the entry to Switzerland. So that has been quite a, a tricky situation, but the result shows that the, yeah, it, it's, it has been done in a, in, a, in a good way after all. And uh, finally, now with the lockdown, I would say, really this gradual easing so far it seems has worked also and uh, we of course we now hope simply that there is no second wave coming to, to hopefully yes in fact in the initial days uh, when we were watching on to the swiss news we we heard that switzerland was under pressure or was under influence to think of closing down its border to the neighboring countries and as a schengen country uh, it allows a lot of free movement as you rightly said but I guess that Swiss government did go immediately for the border close at the initial stage. Well, actually, that has been quite a controversy in, in the beginning. You know, we had there has been a hotspot of Corona uh, cases in the northern part of Italy. So just bordering to Switzerland. And of course, the immediate reaction would have been to, to close immediately those, those border points. But as I said, because of this interconnection with Italy also, for various reasons, we... we decided or the government decided not to close completely or immediately. Austria, for instance, has done it faster and uh, perhaps it has paid off uh, also in, 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 the, in the number of cases. Uh, it's always difficult to, on the other hand, of course, we also, as I mentioned, we, we have had in the southern parts of Switzerland, we were also uh, interested to have the uh, workers from Italy coming into Switzerland in, in, uh, and also keeping the, the, the economy afloat. And uh, so many right. interests had to be also uh, taken care of and looked at, uh, at in, in the beginning. Right. Thank you, Mr. Adiga, for this insightful information. I'm coming to Max now. Max, uh, uh, I'm sure that your school has just announced that you opened up uh, campuses and uh, hopefully you'll be uh, inviting the students to jo join the next intake from the next month onwards, if I'm not wrong. 
So how the scenario looks like and what the standards are in place at your school uh, to ensure the safety of the international students and what you've learned out of this the past experiences. Thank you very much, Islam. First of all, it's a great pleasure to be here with everybody, and especially this wonderful group of uh, speakers in, in the panel. Great pleasure being with you. Um, I have to let's, let's just go back to the idea that you know we are the, the largest hospitality education provider in the country, a private provider of hospitality education. And across the year, we have about 6,000 students from 111 countries coming in. And we take these measures that have been taken very seriously in order to be able to make sure that education and learning can actually take place because without safety and well-being, there is no education to be had. Those are much higher priorities, which we've been taking very seriously. Now, across our five, and, you know, five schools and six campuses across the country that we have, we initially started uh, as soon as the measures were coming in through the federal uh, government, we were taking exactly following those. And even before them, trying to isolate the campuses, the students as much as possible and making sure, you know, temper checks and every kind of symptom were, were being monitored and safety measures on campus, sanitizing everything, et cetera. And as you know, we, we provided the students the possibility to leave campus, take their assignments uh, on time and making sure that the flexibility on the academic side of things were there so that the students would safely be able to immediately leave even their inter internship positions that they had across the country, go back to their loved ones and their families, and then to be able to kick off the last quarter as of April on an online solution, what we call the VLE, like the rest of the world, and thanks to Zoom, we were able to offer all the courses basically on a virtual learning experience setting, and it's been going on ever since. Now, we're moving towards, for our, some of our schools, you know, including Caesar Ritz Colleges, of course, where I am in Lucerne, we are going to open the next term, which is in July, and we are taking every measure to slowly and carefully and safely do this. And because of that, we're only opening two of our campuses instead of the three Caesar Ritz Colleges that we have, which is in the French-speaking side, Le Bouvre, and on the German-speaking side, very close to the Italian border, in fact, uh, in the Brick campus, we're doing this very safely, welcoming the students back and trying to monitor again, very much based on symptoms, based on the situation of where the students are coming from so that this can happen in accordance to all the legal implications that there are and all the measures that the government has been taking and which we are deeply grateful for because obviously I've been here personally myself with the rest of the team and the, the colleagues uh, of Swiss Education Group and we've been seeing really the development of how Switzerland has been able to cope with this on the surface, unfaced, and, and, and in a very relaxed mode initially, and then gradually coming up with the lockdown. And the residents, and I have to just commend the residents and the citizens of Switzerland, the way they've been respecting every guidance right. and keeping the social distancing at the best possible way along the entire period, even days as such as this, which is beautiful sunshine, it's really a summer day where you wanna get out there and be on the lake and really socialize. People do that, but they do that under great responsibility. And I really believe that this combined with the measures of the government uh, has led to the fact that this, this ranking, which I have to say as well, was surprising to me too, to see this. And it's a great, delightful surprise to see and I hope that the rest of the world very soon can move in that direction so that we can open up completely and go towards this new normal so yes we are opening up across the group our uh, other schools uh, Swiss Hotel Management School and uh, IHTTI School of Hotel Management they're going to open their doors in September their term opening but our uh, other school in HIM Hotel Institute Montreux uh, will do that together with Caesar Ritz Colleges in July and every single measure in, is in place to keep the social distancing, the, the security and the safety going on carefully, man, you know, monitoring the uh, symptoms, and at the same time making sure that a lot of students who are still unable to travel to us from across the world are able to take their courses and modules still online, connected to the live classroom teaching that we're having. So we don't want to leave any student behind uh, online or offline and that's so far been a great team effort across the group which hand in hand 
with every canton of Switzerland, the regional uh, governments of Switzerland that we deal with, it's simply been a show of collaboration and mutual path forward. And we're very proud of that. Right. That's true. I mean, uh, I think it's a lot of care which has been taken because as a school, you're also housing the students on campus. And that's a dual responsibility for you also to make sure the students who are preferred to stay back onto the campus to take care of themselves as well. All right. So uh, I just want to move to uh, Ms. Devika. Now, how the Indian scenario looks like, because we are seeing that uh, the lockdown has not necessarily has uh, impacted uh, positively to the expectation, what we were thinking of, and what the government's uh, uh, regulations looks like for restarting the school for this uh, academic year. Uh, sorry, you're mute. Can you please unmute yourself? I don't think she's not able to unmute herself. Somebody might have to. I, I have. Uh, it's happened. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the situation in our uh, city is concerned, Mumbai. Mm -hmm. uh, the lockdown and the social distancing and uh, the fear of the pandemic is still very much there. We are planning to start our school from uh, 15th, Monday. And we are do, doing it on the virtual mode. And uh, we keep telling ourselves, the only thing that is missing will be the physical school building. Everything in school, um, including our curriculum, the teachers, the learners, we are all here. And we are starting off our school uh, in the virtual mode. So uh, in Mumbai at present, I don't think uh, we would be able to start uh, the campus and reopen the campus for learners anytime soon. So that is the situation. Keeping that in mind, we have uh, 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 schools with the training for uh, teachers, training for learners, training for parents in case the learners are very young so that we can come on board and start with the process of learning. So it means that it's not only the student, but everybody is learning at this Absolutely. Our teachers have, uh, I think in the past uh, uh, three months, they have just uh, turned around and changed the scenario to such an extent that uh, it is amazing to even go into one of these virtual sessions. Uh, there are uh, uh, hundreds of different ways in which they made the uh, lessons and uh, sessions engaging. They are dealing with all age groups. They have come up with different ways of assessment, formative assessment, so that they can understand the level of uh, um, skill that each child has uh, reached. They have also figured out ways of uh, motivating learners who are at home and who are under lockdown for a long time. Right. So they have come up with various different activities to engage learners in the best way. Yes, absolutely. We were seeing some of the videos, you know, making the students engaging activities very interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I just want to come to Dr. Munjal. Uh, uh, Dr. Talwar, uh, how is BM Munjal University is looking at this situation and what's the scenario at your place in North India and what's the starting point uh, to take up this academic year? So we are slightly away from uh, Delhi. So uh, let's say from the uh, Delhi airport will be another 50, 55 kilometers down the Jaipur Highway. So um, in our part of the woods, um, uh, there's not been that much of a, uh, you know, an effect. But as far as the university is concerned, um, right from the 18th of March, we were completely online. So we had about one or two days to decide on what do we do. And of course, the government directive uh, kind of, um, in a way, helped us make a decision. So right from the 18th of March, we've been completely uh, online. Um, and uh, you know what we tend to do is um, we've also had our uh, examinations taking place online, right? So if I uh, look at the uh, management school, so I look after the you know management school as one of my responsibility. So we've we've not had a downtime as such uh, because of the fact that you can easily um, uh, get the various tools. So you were talking about Zoom earlier, but predominantly it's not just about the the tool or the technology availability, but I think it's also about how um, you know the learning actually takes place. So in a way for us, um, we've been um, you know, up, up to 
the ability to be able to uh, create a learning experience online has been rather surprising for us as well, to be honest. For everybody, it was uh, a new learning experience. You've got to remember that most um, higher education institutions in India um, have not necessarily uh, transitioned themselves into a format which is more technology uh, mediated, uh, right? But in a sense, we were all forced to do that uh, post the middle of March. And I think a lot of the progressive universities, um, um, the newer age universities have actually, actually taken this like fish to water. Uh, of course, what is important also is that, you know, at least our um, um, research suggests that a lot of people who are maybe, you know, great in the classroom, in the physical surroundings, um, a lot of them may have actually found it a little bit more difficult to align themselves into the online mode. But whereas the other people who may not necessarily have been, um, you know, very evolved from a physical presence perspective, a lot of them actually uh, started using a lot of tools, whether it is um, uh, Padlet, whether it is Socrative, whether it is Mentimeter, whether it is many other things that they've started using. And of course, being able to create that learning experience online. So for us, it's been online. In fact, our examinations also take place online. Okay. So it's all AI proctored, um, and at the same time, it's uh, essentially emulating the invigilation process that we normally tend to follow in a physical environment. Exactly. That's, that's good to note about the, the, that's, that's the meaning of, I guess, the progressive university, and that you're leading from the front with these tools and techniques. I would like to come back to Mr. Hardik, and uh, this time, uh, sir, can you please show us some lights on to how uh, the government is planning to welcome the uh, international students? Uh, especially from the health and, health and safety point of view, and if you can also throw some lights on the visa process, how it's going to look like. Yes, so for just important to say that the situation can of course change, is in a, in a, in a constant uh, flow, and, and, and right now I, I can say starting actually June 15, Things will open up. We will open the, the borders with all the Schengen countries. So what already makes it relatively easy to move within Europe. Now, when it comes to uh, students from outside, uh, from so-called third countries, uh, there are still restrictions, of course. Uh, it is, however, it is, however, possible now to, to apply for, for students visa at the Swiss Embassy in Delhi. Right now, it's still uh, necessary that the person or the applicants travel to Delhi and apply physically in person at the embassy. And of course, they need to take a prior appointment. So it, it, it is, of course, a little bit more time consuming than uh, it, it used to be in the past. But uh, the good part is the visa applications are processed and then there is a good chance, of course, that these students will be able to fly out soon also uh, to Switzerland. And uh, in Switzerland arriving, there is no quarantine requirement for travelers entering Switzerland unless they, they would have symptoms of illness. And uh, just the travelers need to observe the usual rules for hygiene and social distancing, just mentioned before by Mr. Behesh. And uh, there is nothing particular to, to, to take care of in Switzerland. In public uh, transports, there is a recommendation to use face masks, even though I hear that uh, there are not too many people observing these uh, recommendations uh, so far. But uh, And then, of course, in public life, now things have opened up. Now all the restaurants are open again, shops, museums are open. They also have, of course, they have their precautionary measures. Uh, then. For the schools, the federal government has also issued some kind of basic rules, recommendations for classroom teaching. And these schools that are opening up now, they, of course, they had to elaborate on, and to work on a concept how they can guarantee all these uh, recommendations and safety rules. So there is not, nothing really to worry about. I think that's, uh, that's very well taken care of. And I would say that the schools are well prepared. Now, uh, they have had time really to prepare and uh, I would say the situation right now is also really under control currently. There are very few uh, new cases uh, coming up in Switzerland. So, so the whole scare of the, of the, the pandemic is, 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 uh, is 
much less than before, of course. And I also have to say, I was also relieved to see also the findings that the, the, the researchers have done that say, okay, that actually children and young adult, adults between 10 and 29 years are not really a risk group. And interestingly, also in this age group, nobody has died in Switzerland. Just also to show that uh, I think for young people, it is uh, really a safe country to, to travel. And uh, I think most all these schools that are re uh, welcoming now the new students, they are well prepared for. Right, sir. So I'm just connecting what you mentioned to one of the uh, questions we, we have received in the chat box from Tanvi that she is interested to apply and uh, she's looking forward to see whether she can go and approach the Delhi embassy for the process. So as per what you mentioned, that she can start a process and she can apply to Delhi embassy with a prior appointment. Right, exactly. Okay. Take an appointment and uh, yeah, has to travel to, to Delhi to, to, to submit the application. Right. So Tani, uh, I hope that that answers your question. And uh, just an additional note, what uh, Mr. Hardiger also mentioned, that there is no present requirement to get yourself quarantined. So when you arrive, you can, if you do not have any symptoms, you can straight away start your classes. Thank you for the asking question. And then we have got a few questions also. Uh, we'll take along the way. Uh, Max, so coming back to you. Uh, so how you, you and your school uh, is preparing yourself to uh, welcome the students uh, are we talking about uh, postponing intake so that we can accommodate more students to come in this academic year so they do not lose on to uh, this period? Or how, I mean, is your school is going out to reach out to students to help them to secure the finances or help them into the finances because the situation, economical situation is also not that great. Uh, and then many parents were also looking for these kind of answers uh, from the schools. Uh, what is your reply as a school dean? Thanks, Jayaslam. Now. Again, following the, the words from Mr. Hardiger in terms of the response from the government and the collaboration we had, I think the main challenge we had was back in March, where all of a sudden, we truly, within the same day, we decided everything's going to be shut down and we are enabling for our students to leave. And that was right about the exam period and all the assignments and trying to get that. And then we had only two weeks to get our, across the team, our faculty to get ready for the online solution. And not only to be able to provide an online solution, but, it, but to truly take uh, all our program uh, modules and courses, which connect very much to the experience of hospitality and also to certain practical elements to fit in an engaging and entertaining way uh, on a VLE, on an online platform basis. Now, that's basically what we are bringing along and learning from for going forward toward July and September. So our students have the ability and full option to if they cannot travel right in July, they can simply start up and take their courses online until the moment, the very day they are able to travel. And then our campuses are ready to welcome them immediately. So during the term, they are perfectly fine to come over and, and just continue their courses, which they've been following from day one in July, and to resume their studies physically on campus. I think that flexibility really aligns and, and, and helps the situation in a way that as soon as it's, it is safe to travel, then our doors are open to welcome every single student back to our campuses where we are really carefully following the guidelines and making sure we're taking extra measures safely for carrying out the teaching. And of course, it's not only about being on campus and taking your courses in our classrooms, our programs and our, our existence in Switzerland is very much connected to the experience of hospitality, the experience of everything that Switzerland as a country has to offer, the diverse mix of crowd that we, and visitors that we have in the country, the beautiful scenery that is there, the amazing hospitality, especially luxury hospitality that is available and can be experienced by anybody visiting the country. And, and so for us, that safe, uh, attitude and, 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 and basically setting an atmosphere across the country is essential for our students as well because we have no intention of keeping our students locked up on a campus and that's not the experience that we generally offer. So this combination goes hand in hand and is absolutely essential for us to do. So th this is basically how we're taking the steps forward, learning from the past 
And, and I agree again with Mr. Hardiger. I think there is one word that is uh, uncertainty that everybody is now worried about because I totally understand any family out there and, and the students themselves that are wondering, what if we have a second wave? And everybody wonders that. And that is one of the reasons why we are taking our opening of our campuses also as a gradual process and not opening every single campus. For instance, Lucerne is remaining closed. And I have to say that we learned from what happened in March. And if there would be such a scenario, this is of course something we've done also in our discussions and meetings with the authorities and within our management team, that if something comes up again, we know exactly how to deal with it as we did back in March and the systems and the controls that we have in place will allow us to once again, support every single student and their families to safely go back home if necessary. But also as we have had along these few months, we've had students who have not been able to travel back home to their countries and they've been safely staying on our campuses, provided meals and everything necessary so that they can continue take their studies and be safe until they would be able to travel back during the break and meet their families and loved ones. Right. Thank you, Max, for that. And I, help, uh, I believe that this would help a lot of students who are asking related questions. And I can come back to you one of the specific questions which has been asked about the visa process later on. Uh, but meantime, I would like to invite uh, Debika on the, this point that how your school is going to be welcoming the students when they would be available to join the face-to-face -face classes. So have you taken up specific measures or have you consulted a consultant? Because I've heard a lot of consultants are coming up now to consult the organizations or the schools to make sure that the proper care has been taken up. We have, we have as a group. So we are a school uh, uh, which belongs to the JVCN group and we have four schools and in all four schools the sanitization of each and every room every floor has already started even though we don't know the date of the school starting the provisions for uh, social distancing uh, the provisions for uh, ensuring that uh, children are safe whenever it happens has has the discussions have started. The physical school, as soon as we come across government directives, because uh, we are aware that the government is also monitoring the situation very closely. We are, I think, on the other side of the spectrum where uh, Switzerland is already opening up. Mumbai is uh, one of the few places in India where uh, we are still not sure whether in the near future we would be able to go back to the school. We are are ready with our preparation internally the uh, government directives is what we are waiting for as soon as that is in place we will be ready to start physical school again right. in the meanwhile for the first quarter of school we are planning uh, virtual sessions in the first quarter uh, which starts like i said on monday right so just related to this uh, point uh, uh, i was just wondering that your school is also offering the international curriculum and yes. I'm sure that many yes. students look after to go after 12th straight away to abroad and they seek a lot of guidance in that way. So how your schools has managed to handle these queries and what are these students are doing now? Uh, at the moment, the, uh, since we are in the virtual mode, everything is being handled. So we have our uh, academic guidance counselor in house. I think uh, Rita is also here with us today. Uh, he is uh, taking individual students uh, through the uh, process. She is speaking to groups of learners. Our uh, coordinators and heads of departments are speaking to children as well as their parents so that students are well prepared to move forward uh, as soon as they can. At the moment, again, like I said, everything is happening virtually. We are not leaving anything out. So even the academic gu guidance for learners in order to move forward with their journey or as a student in another uh, country perhaps or in another, another college in a different part of the uh, uh, of our uh, own country that everything is happening online and, and it is happening very regularly. We also have uh, uh, 
representatives of various universities speaking to our learners uh, through the virtual model. So right. it's happening, except that it is happening virtually. Virtually, okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Talwar, uh, how's your school is preparing uh, to welcome the students and when do you think in your side of India, when do you think that you'll be able to have uh, that opportunity for face-to-face -face counseling? So very similar uh, to what Debika mentioned, I think everything that we're doing currently is completely on the uh, online medium. Uh, having said that, we now have some indications from the government uh, about which month we can possibly open up. So what's happening is that um, a lot of uh, institutions and uh, um, you know, universities might actually start off um, you know, online initially, it's possible, uh, sometime in July. So I know that a number of management institutions, for example, uh, will uh, by the middle of July or towards the last week of July start opening up uh, with their orientations, um, with their first module or the semester, depending on what they call it. And then uh, look for a green signal from the, um, the government authorities about sometime in August. I believe the dates are somewhere between the 10th and the 15th of August currently, when uh, students can physically come into the campus. And of course, um, that's what it is currently. That's how it stands. And of course, post coming to the campus, uh, the, the SOP is about the standard operating procedures about what kind of class capacity there will be. You know, how do you rotate the curriculum? How do you ensure that, you know, if I talk about ourselves, we are a residential campus. So automatically, a lot of SOP is related to, uh, you know, the, you know the, the university residence, halls of residence, uh, a lot of SOPs regarding the infrastructure, how will the auditorium be used, how will the classes be used, everything is currently being, uh, being chalked out. Um, so quite, um, you know, frankly, a lot of the uh, universities right now must be going through this drill at the moment. And if, you know, the reason why I call it a drill is because a lot of them are actually going through the various uh, probabilities, various, uh, you know, uh, issues that might possibly come up when physical presence uh, comes into the campus. But right now, that's, that's what it is. We have standard operating procedures. They're all kind of in place. Um, uh, and we're just essentially waiting for a green signal from the uh, government. And I believe sometime in August, uh, they'll be allowing a physical presence. That's what currently it stands at. Right, right. That's it. So the admissions are still open for the students to come in for bachelor's and master's program at your university? Oh, yes, uh, very much. Uh, it, it's open uh, at the moment uh, at all levels. I would, I would imagine uh, undergraduate um, uh, you know, physical classes uh, will obviously start a little later than maybe the postgraduate classes. So I would imagine towards the uh, middle or the end of August or even the, you know, very early in September is when undergraduation is, as of now, is likely to, um, you know, start. I believe because of the nature of the curriculum for most postgraduate courses, I think a lot of the online classes will start earlier. Um, and then thereafter, depending on circumstances, a lot of physical um, existence will happen post that. Right. So uh, that brings me to uh, towards the uh, last part of the questions, whereby it is more related to technology. And I would like to invite Mr. Hardegar in to it, said, uh, how do you see the, the use of AI and use of technology, which is going to impact uh, the day-to-day -day operations at the Swiss Embassy or at the consulate level? And what the impact you expect it to have in your operations? Uh, is uh, the offices going to transform its operation to you know, uh, cope up these kind of challenges in the future? Or is there any plan in place? You're speaking purely about visa procedures now, or? Yeah, the, yes. the operation the process of the Swiss office process for the visa. For, for the visa. OK. There are two points that I'd like to mention in this uh, regards. First of all, there is, of course, it's, it's we are in the Schengen uh, part of the Schengen system so right now we we are of course we we uh, stopped the visa procedures in march for the normal visa procedure for until june 15 just today it was also uh, decided that <clears throat> over the next one or two weeks they will decide about opening up again the the visa application process for for anybody just uh, travel wanting to travel to the to europe to the schengen countries so this is still uh, something that is in the pipeline. And as you know, we, we have had uh, also this application 
external service provider for the visa application, VFS, the company that uh, has accepted all the visa applications in the past in various cities in India. So this also, this application service has stopped temporarily. This will resume uh, over the next weeks, I, I suppose. This is, yeah, will need to be seen. And I would simply just recommend to anybody who has uh, any uh, visa related questions to carefully follow the uh, information given on the websites of VFS, given of course also on the website of the Swiss Embassy in New Delhi to, to see what, what's going on uh, regarding visa policy first but then also the application procedure. I just saw there have been a couple of questions regarding application time, time uh, needed for a student visa to apply. Normally it's between six and eight weeks uh, until there is a, a positive response. I would say just play safe, try to apply even a little bit earlier than, than in the past to be on the safe side. And as I said, the situation is changing now uh, constantly. Just follow up also with, with the embassy and uh, with, with the information that is giving uh, there. Yes, sir. Well, well, well said. But so uh, with this, Max, uh, uh, if uh, if I talk about the futuristic situation, you know, a post visa uh, a situation where students would come and study. And we talk about the futuristic education scenario, how it ideally looks like. Uh, what do you see and how do you see the sustainability is playing a role? And I, I, I've, I've seen uh, this word in your curriculum somewhere, if I remember correctly, uh, along with entrepreneurship. So would you like to showcase, uh, take us through that, how this uh, subject is going to help to tackle these kind of situation may arise in future? Thanks. Uh, absolutely, Aslam. Now, of course, Caesarist colleges per se, we follow much, very much the spirit and the principle of Caesarist, the legendary entrepreneur, the Swiss gentleman who, who passed away more than a hundred years ago. And still, he's the one who changed the scenery of luxury hospitality and really innovated. Now, we, in that spirit, we, of course, are focused very much on entrepreneurship, leadership, combined and hand in hand with the spirit of sustainability in every segment possible in every way possible. So we do believe that the new normal will mean that there is a hand in hand combination of what's available online and every single technical solution and technology based solution available. We don't like to push it and force it in anywhere where it's simply not needed or necessary, but wherever it is available to enhance the learning and whenever, wherever is available for safely enhancing learning or enabling it we are looking at every single scenario to be able to combine and create something better uh, something that covid has brought along as a positive impact has been that the the willingness to change and move along and develop i've never seen such a speedy movement across organizations where usually it would take months of training and, and arguments and discussions and negotiations to move along in a certain direction. And due to the situation, we've seen movements within weeks where across the organizations, people have been uh, teaming up, accepting the situation, thanks to also the governmental support within Switzerland of uh, allowing, allowing companies to survive and maintain their employees. It's also been something that has been enabled. So I really believe that if we choose to see it as an opportunity to develop and grow, it will certainly take us to new pathways towards sustainable uh, education and sustainability being built in in every single thing we do. We try to you know, redefine the experience and the art of hospitality across industries. And what better way to do that in a safe, sustainable way going forward? So frankly, uh, if everything remains well and safe and opening up the way it's looking, I am personally very optimistic about what's about to come. Okay, well said, Max. Uh, Devika, um, I'm so just talking about the sustainability as a very important uh, part of the curriculum, uh, which looks like for most of the schools and colleges. Uh, how your school is taking the initiative to teach the students about uh, using this uh, uh, subject and then facing uh, these kind of unforeseen challenges in future? 
Um, first of all, I would like to say sustainability is not a subject. Uh, it is a way of life in our school. And uh, we have been uh, focusing on it for many, many years now. Uh, we started with small things like reduce, reuse, and recycle. And it is for the youngest children uh, moving forward to the oldest in the school. However, as we have grown, a lot of our students have matured into um, individuals who have taken this uh, path of sustainability forward in their own way. I would like to cite a few examples of what has happened in the school in the past few years. Uh, year before last, we had our annual concerts and it was decided that we are going to do it in the most sustainable manner possible. We had the full school moving forward and we used only sustainable material uh, things like uh, cloth, things like uh, uh, reused chart papers and all. And the full school annual concert was taken forward in that manner. We have had students coming in to say that we would not like to use uh, ballpoint pens. We would rather use fountain pens because those are things which we don't have to use and throw. There are students who have come in and told me in the recent past that I used to have at, at least 15 pairs of jeans, but I have understood that I can live with three. <laughs> that's, when I, uh, that's why I say that uh, sustainability is not a subject in our school. It is a way of life. And each and every person in the school, every decision that we take, we talk about the sustainable way of doing it. And the best part is our school is a plastic bag free zone. Yeah. And we never passed a law. So we never ever put down anywhere on paper that you should not use plastic bags or you should not bring plastic bags to school. It has happened because of conversations, because of the general idea that all of us have understood, understood that reusing and recycling is not enough anymore. It is time to reduce, reduce and reduce. Right, absolutely. I think your, your school is doing a fantastic job and with your initiative, uh, it's good that... Everyone in school, everyone in school, from the youngest child to the oldest uh, uh, person in the school, we are all on that path. Very nice. And it's good that the kids at the very early stage, they get the importance of being sustainable and being a part of this eco new ecology. Uh, that uh, uh, asked me to uh, get to Dr. Talwar and how your school looks at uh, this terminology is sustainability and especially you uh, being the dean also of the entrepreneurship. So how do you take this uh, put together? So I think sustainability is obviously quite important, um, you know, and, and Devika Ma'am's right. Um, it's, the, it's the small kids who teach us. My daughter, if she sees my uh, tap running for too long, all of a sudden she switches off and says, save water. So I think it's this whole reverse uh, trend that actually um, is very good. And I, I would imagine a lot of the modern progressive schools right now in India, uh, is being able to inculcate that kind of values uh, in, in, in the kids. So that's very good. I think um, uh, sustainability um, is fundamentally important. I think uh, if I expand the sustainability definition a bit, I think this whole idea of um, the Indian way of innovation or this whole idea of um, frugal innovation or this whole idea of uh, innovating based around the bottom of the pyramid a lot of these ideas are essentially part of this whole concept of uh, sustainability or its manifestation. So fundamentally speaking, I think um, uh, universities, higher education institutions have a major role to play to ensure that they're able to co-create a lot of sustainable products, services from the Indian context. And I think, um, you know, some of the new schools, some of the new universities like ours, who have uh, innovation entrepreneurship as a major thrust, I think they are also uh, contributing to this whole idea. They not only work with their own students uh, to be able to create a more um, you know, viable products or services going forward, which are sustainable, which are meant for the, uh, not only the, you know, um, for premium uh, markets, but also for the masks uh, that uh, India has. So I think um, we have a major role to play uh, in this. And I think um, some of the universities such as ours are actually uh, doing that. 
What is also important is that, um, you know, we're, we as a university are also backed up by a major corporate, Hero. So Hero is the largest manufacturer of uh, motorcycles in the world. Um, and, you know, you know, for them, it's, a, it's a, what I would call as a story that started off uh, post, uh, you know, migration, uh, you know, having nothing, having a small cycle repair shop, and now they're essentially beyond a $5 billion group. So automatically, that also manifests itself into, yes, I think we need to create more entrepreneurs. We need to cre create more job uh, producers rather than job consumers. And sustainability plays a major role. Sorry for a long answer. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much. Aslam, may I just say something, Aslam, in, yeah, you sure. know, just following Dr. Salvar there, um, in terms of manifesting sustainability, and seeing shapes and forms of it. I think I, I need to say something encouraging to everybody that I've experienced uh, with our students is that it is not easy to stay focused and, and, and uh, you know, take your learning in your own hands when you're doing it online. You're easily distracted, it easily gets boring, your attention span is, is not that long anymore, especially with new generations and everything. And what something we've been seeing and experiencing is that a great deal of our students have been able to, in fact, create that learning atmosphere within their own home setting and wherever they are. And they've really taken a step further in, in maturing in a way that they understand more the purpose and the why they are in fact taking a certain program. Because one of the things that I always say to our students, you know, we don't want them to take a three year degree, a double degree after three years, a full year of work experience, and then go to mommy and daddy and say, mommy, daddy, what am I supposed to do now? And we take that personal experience and personal development very seriously from day one. And this is something we've seen that for a lot of our students, that responsibility has gone over to them a lot more and they've owned up to it and matured with it. And that clearly connects to their sustainable paths in the future to take ownership of their footprint and, and the trail they'll leave behind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said, Ms. Max. Uh, Mr. Hardik, I, I believe that the, the U Swiss universities have done an exceedingly great job uh, in the field of research and innovation, and especially in the field of sustainability. And Swiss Next Office has been also working in closely with regards to it. And then uh, I, I believe a lot of Indian students also look for uh, the Switzerland universities for the research-based program in this particular area. And uh, I think it, 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 the government is also doing a great job by supporting these initiatives and causes which encourage other countries to follow the footprint. Right. I would say Switzerland is in a, in a very good position when it comes to science innovation. We, we, we have our, yeah, we were very happy to have universities and uh, technical uh, uh, colleges very at a very high level. Just recently, again, we, we the, this new ranking came out actually, and about eight of the the, the Swiss universities were among the 100 best universities world, worldwide, which shows a little bit the the, the level and the, the, the standard of our uh, ed, uh, higher education system. When it, of course, I have to say also we we are also happy and very proud to have also. Uh, students from India, of course, and attending these universities. Also, we are very happy for each uh, student coming for whatever uh, studies it is, if it is uh, management studies, if it is hospitality studies, whatever. I think we are, we are very happy to, to share with, with, uh, Indian, with India also these uh, opportunities. And uh, we are really happy to see also that we, and to hear, always that there are excellent students also coming from India, being part of uh, science uh, research teams also in Switzerland. And I think you mentioned Swissnex before, Swissnex is active of course, connecting the Indian uh, science part with the Swiss science part and is doing an excellent job in that. And I think thanks to this uh, also, there has been a lot of uh, new connections established in the last years that bring very encouraging results for both sides, I would say. And uh, we're really happy to, to, to have this very close cooperation with a number of universities here in India too. Right, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing this information. So uh, with this, I would just like to ask for those if we have any uh, specific question uh, left unanswered before we just conclude this session.
we do have two questions in the chat box. One is of Pratigya, whether we can, you know, the students can defer their studies if they don't get visa on time. Okay. So for which intake? Possibly for the September or October intake. Okay. Okay. So Max, uh, uh, if the students who applies for September and in case if they do not get the visa in time, so can they defer and come back in the January, February? And if you're very good. Yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, so again, it goes clearly back to the support we've been receiving by the authorities to be extremely flexible whenever necessary. And uh, what's been happening that the students already uh, having their permits and their visas, they've been extended to a great deal so that they can defer their studies. And for the students that are new, we are have been supporting every single student to defer their studies to a later term so that they can safely travel over as soon as possible. Okay. So that flexibility have been there all along in a very good uh, way. Okay, thank you very much, Max. Any other question for those? As if no, most of them have been answered. Okay, great. One, there's one more question just came right away. If mm -hmm. a student who arrives in Switzerland unfortunately happens to test positive for COVID-19, what measures would the government take? How would the school assist the student and their family? Uh, okay, Mr. Hardiger, would you like to have your opinion on that? Yes, well, there are of course recommendations to, to travelers, students or whatever travelers arriving to Switzerland and uh, being tested positive. In fact, there are simple rules of isolation and, and uh, quarantine, but uh, it's 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 this kind of information you can you can also download or you can uh, find on on the website of the uh, federal office of public health and uh, it's it's these are si simple rules basically uh, like like you would apply here also in india first of all of course to to isolate to to, to not to get in touch with any other person is, uh, and, 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 and to see also the development of, 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 the, of the situation. And of course, if the situation gets worse, I'm sure then also the, the schools, the universities, they will assist also to find the, or to, to get into proper medical treatment. Okay, great. So I hope that answers uh, the questions that have been asked. So uh, just before I close, I would just like to ask all of our speakers uh, one line a closing note. So starting from Devika ma'am, uh, uh, just to conclude this topic, can I have your views please? Just that, it, this is the time of, of uh, great uh, uh, discomfort for all of us, but there is still a silver lining. And I think the teachers in all schools across countries have, have uh, shown themselves after doctors and nurses and health workers, the teachers are the ones who are a part of that silver lining and, and congratulations to the full team of teachers across countries for coming up the way they have with innovative, creative ways of running educational institutions. So gratitude and congratulations to everyone. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure that it must not be easy time, especially for the teachers and not the at, faculties. Not yes. at all. Absolutely. Right. Thank you very much, ma'am. Dr. Talwar. Okay, sorry about the uh, muting thing. Okay. Well, I mean, um, carrying on with what Ms. Chatterjee said, uh, this too shall pass. I think I'm sure the students have uncertainties, uh, you know, in their mind, whether they want to, you know, be in India, whether they want to go abroad. But I think we're all thinking about uh, the next 40, 50 years of our lives and not necessarily in the next six months or one year. So I think let that long-term vision not uh, be derailed. That's all. Right. Thank you very much. That's very insightful. Uh, Max, would like. Well, you know, you know uh, how we say that. You know, why do we fall to learn to stand up again? And as the world has fallen on this, I believe that the world will stand again. And for the youth out there, for people who have their entire education and program ahead of them, that is nothing but exciting. Truly, if you can safely get through this, I always say. I always read a quote by Emerson who said, "Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path." and leave a trail behind you. And this 
will, because a lot of people come to me and they also ask me about the hospitality industry and what's going to happen. But I believe that the world has shifted so much that if you uniquely understand why you do what you do and the service you offer to the world and you shape it mindfully, look forward, you will be in a whole new trajectory in your journey. And this will be nothing but an incredible opportunity instead of something that's setting you back as an individual and as a youngster getting out there and educating yourself. So I think that the world has shifted so much that the new normal is full of opportunities for those who are hungry and mentally ready to face it. Thank you very much. Very well said, Max. Uh, Mr. Hardika, on behalf of this office, would you like to say something to our students, uh, counselors and schools? Well, first of all, I, I think it's, it's important to keep optimism, to, to stay optimistic. And I think there are always developments that give you reason to be optimistic. You know, now some countries are emerging out of the corona crisis, some countries that have been really heavily touched by the pandemic, and they are coming out and they're opening up again, and, and things look really also positive there. Of course, it's very sad for all the life uh, lives that have been lost and, and of course people that have suffered also economically in this time and we have to always think of them too but on the other hand I think there is as I said optimism there there is also my feeling that there will be also new innovation coming out of this you mentioned before sustainability artificial intelligence and so on I think it has been probably a time where a lot has been uh, yeah all of a sudden we were forced to look at from a different angle also, and that will give us opportunities to, to do it better, to take learnings and definitely also this pandemic has forced us to, to learn for many things. And uh, I, I would say if we all take some learnings out of this, then uh, we, we will also go for a good future again. Absolutely, that's a very positive line of uh, conclusions that we should take the learning out of this difficult situation and move further. So with this, um, I would really thank you, uh, Ms. Devika Chatterjee, Mr. Othman Hardikar, uh, Mr. Max Behisht, and Dr. Vishal Talwar for joining us today. It was a really wonderful session we had on education post COVID-19 world, where Switzerland is leading the world as the safest country by popes. We thank you for all our listeners, school teachers, counselors, students, and parents. And just to conclude, uh, you have a chance to apply to the institutes who you have seen speaking them. Uh, they still have got the admissions uh, open for them. Uh, if you travel to Switzerland, you have got the visa process coming in place. So you can go and approach Delhi Embassy. You can take the help of our office to apply for the student visa. And if you have any deferment, college will try to accommodate your request. And uh, the exciting news, which we promised in the beginning, is that uh, with the help of our schools, we are offering a free airfare to students who are going for this year to go to Switzerland to study. And this is just an uh, encouraging step so that we can say that it's a safe place and it's a safe world. So let's do travel and live our life back to normal. So with this, I would like to conclude the session. We'll be back again next week with another interesting topic and some amazingly talented speakers. Till that time, stay safe and stay excited. Thank you very much, all the speakers. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Aslam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aslam. Thank you, Mr. Adiga. Thank you very much.